Hare Krishna, Hare 
Yeah. I can reduce it. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. so this is another uh, a different one. Okay. A different one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we got to. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, thank you so much for coming on a very short notice today. So I really appreciate it. It's a working day and I can start understand the challenges. And I know some of you were not present in uh, last uh, program that we had uh, Mataji's home. So it's a great fortune, uh, that fortune that we have uh, His Grace Mukundar Prabhu with us. Uh, Prabhuji is an initiated disciple of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri the founder Acharya of the International Society of Pro Krishna Consciousness. Prabhuji joined ISKCON 45 plus years ago, deeply impressed by the comprehensive, authentic and nectarian presentation of the science of Krishna Bhakti, love of God as clearly explained in many books by Shri Prabhupada. Noted for his kirtan, as you could see, devotional singing, Prabhuji has received formal training in North Indian classical music, sings and plays instruments in traditional Bengali style of kirtan, and has made several recordings of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition Sanskrit and vernacular hymns. Currently, he serves as Sanskrit English translator and editor of Bhakti Vedanta, Bhakti Vedanta Book Trust (BBT). Also, a scholar of Sanskrit, Hindi, and other Indic languages, he served as a member of Shastrik Advisory Council of the Scon Governing Body Commission. He has traveled widely, lecturing for many years on Vedic literature such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So, please welcome Prabhuji. Om Akyana Timirantha Sya Gyanan Jana Shalakaya Chakshura Militam Yenata Smai Shri Guru Venama Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamahyam Yadati Swabadam Trigam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yadavara Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shri Shri Upam Sagrajatam Sahamara Raghunatham Vitam Tam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Shri He Krishna Purna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tatta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Prishapano Sute Devi Pranamami Hare Priye Vancha Kalpat Rukhyascha Kripa Sindhu Pyaevacha Patitanam Pavani Gyo Vaishnavi Pronamaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Varaha Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Madhavira Vipopala Sri Kurya Kripaya Vari Talaiva Sam Priya Pitva Krishna Yustat Priya Dhanaha Hare Krishna Thank you everyone for coming and I didn't have any topic selected to discuss tonight but if anybody wants to hear about something or if anybody has any questions we can maybe just discuss that Yesterday and today. Because that's a very interesting topic of Martin Puni, I guess. So. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 
भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम शरोम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथोजय नित्यं भागवत सेवया भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्ति नैष्ठिकोपगते धनमिधि सह Otherwise, if anyone has a device that you can bring up ten or twelve, canto chapter nine. Twelve canto. Twelve canto. Of course, if anyone has a burning desire to hear about something else, we can discuss yeah. that also. Yeah. It was just a suggestion, I guess. But if anybody has any other suggestions, we can. Do you have any Prabhupada's books here? Yes. So, I have up to tenth canto. I, I, my friend, he borrowed me. Uh, Bring it. <laughs> What does it mean? Krishna is with Hamo Pagate. Tanma Gyana de Pisa. Kalavana Shudrashami Shu. Purana Gotino de Taha. It means that Krishna has, now that Krishna has gone back to his own abode and he brought Tanma and Gyan along with him, where are we going to go for shelter? And the answer is Krishna book. <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a summary study of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We can read it. So, this is also Srimad Bhagavatam. And any particular story or pastime you'd like to hear about? It's an ocean of Bhaktira Sahamrita. Okay, nobody's interested. Should we go home? Okay. <laughs> okay. He wants to hear Puja Navas. Or Truva. Ah? Truva. Truva. But that's not tenth canto. Puja Navas in the tenth canto. So we have the tenth canto in our hands. So let's read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that's third canto. But there's a very beautiful verse spoken by Utava. In the third canto, he says, Oho bakiyam stanakala kutam jighan sarya paya yadapya sadhvi lebhe gatim thatri jitam tatonyam kam vadayalum sharanam brajena. It means, to what more merciful Lord could I possibly go for shelter? Putana came with powerful poison smeared on her breasts in the dis deliberate disguise of a nursemaid just so that she could kill him. That was her motive. But he was so kind that sucking out her life heirs, he brought her back to Godhead and gave her the position of his nursemaid in Balok Vrindavan, alongside his mother <laughs> and her friends. Where is there greater mercy than that? So this is from the 10th canto. And uh, the first demon that Krishna has killed after taking birth in this world. Um, when, while Nanda Maharaj was returning home from Mathura, he considered Vasudeva's warning that there might be some disturbance in Gokula. Vasudeva knew everything. He knew that Kamsa knew. <laughs> what did Kamsa know? Krishna's, it was predicted, Krishna, the, the eighth son of this girl is going to kill you, and that would have been Krishna, and he knew that. And he also heard Subhadra Mani say that this boy has taken birth somewhere else. It's not me, you can't kill me, and she disappeared. So he knew, 
Kamsa knew that Krishna was around somewhere. So Kamsa was killing so many babies in the hope that one of them would be Krishna and he could be uh, saved. So Nanda, Vasudev also knew this because after all, Vasudev was Krishna's father. After Krishna appeared in the prison house of Kamsa, what did Vasudev do? Nobody knows? Took Krishna out and brought him to Goku. Took Krishna out. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, Krishna. Krishna took Kamsa out. <laughs> so he did what he had to do. Just like we, sometimes we just have to do what we have to do. And uh, he didn't know the plot. He had not read the Srimad Bhagavatam yet because it hadn't been written. But he knew that he had to save his son somehow or other. So what happened? All the guards fell asleep miraculously. And all the shackles on Devaki and her husband Vasudev, they became miraculously, inexplicably opened, and he just walked out <laughs> with Krishna. But it was raining outside, and so who, who helped them? He was going towards Gokula to, to hide Krishna with his friend Nanda Maharaj. So what happened in the rain? Did he bring an umbrella? Ananta Shesh came and covered them with his hoods. Then he came to the raging Yamuna River. In the rainy season, it always floods. It's, it's always a problem. And he came and saw this because this would have been September, late August, early September. And it was raining. Storms, just like we had this morning. And he had to cross the Yamuna because that's what he had to do. So what happened? The Yamuna gave way. And what happened in the middle of the Yamuna, crossing Yamuna, while crossing the river, what did Yamuna do? <laughs> the Yamuna came and the, he somehow he dropped Krishna in the river and oh my God, what did he, can you imagine the anxiety? <laughs> so, Yamuna just wanted to get darshan of Krishna, she wanted to touch his feet. So Vasudev found his son again and he went, continued on and he went, uh, Chup chop into the house of his best friend Vasudev, into his best friend's wife's bedroom, where she was sleeping, having just given birth. And what did he do? He abducted his best friend's child. And he put Krishna there in his place. Can you imagine the anxiety? Of what if somebody had come? And how would he explain? What is he doing in my wife's bedroom in the dead of night? And what is his baby doing here? Right? You can't imagine the anxiety, actually. But he had to do something. And he didn't know what he had to do, but he did what he had to do. He figured it out. Krishna gave him the instructions. So anyway, Vasudev was foreseeing all this kind of thing happening. And in fact, after, after he successfully exchanged the children, then he went back to Mathura. Nobody found out. The guards were still asleep. He walked back in again, he shackled up his wife, he shackled himself, and all the doors locked and shut, and then the guards woke up. <laughs> and Vasudev knew, and we know, but nobody else knew. Just see, Shukadev Goswami's mercy upon all of us. We know something that even the, the participants in Krishna Leela didn't know. Maybe to this day they still don't know. So. Anyway, while Nanda Maharaj was returning home, where was Nanda? Nanda. Huh? No. He was returning home. Gokula. Well, Gokula, yes, but he was returning home from Mathura. He had to pay taxes. So then he was coming home. And he considered that uh, Vasudev's words, that Vasudev was warning there might be some problem there in Gokula, so you better go home quickly. So Nanda thought there was some truth in it, and out of fear he began to take shelter of the Supreme Personality of God. And it's quite natural for a devotee in danger to think of Krishna because he has no other shelter. When a child is in danger, he takes shelter of? Mother. Mother, yes. Little, we're talking small, shishu, right? Tokam. <laughs> you heard the word. So, when a child is in danger, he takes shelter of his mother or father. Similarly, a devotee is always under the shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
But when he specifically sees some danger, he remembers the Lord very rapidly. After consulting with his demoniac ministers, Kamsa instructed which named Putana, who knew the black art of killing small children by ghastly, sinful methods. He instructed her to kill all kinds of children in the cities, villages, and pasturing grounds in his kingdom. Such witches can play their black art only where there is no chanting or hearing the holy name of Krishna. We don't have to be afraid of boots and crates and pishachis and rakshasas and all these things. Because if we chant Hare Krishna, they cannot come any, they cannot perform any nonsense with us. <laughs> you want to hear a true story, ghost story? Yes. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada was renting a house somewhere, I don't remember where it was. Mm -hmm. Was it Srila Prabhupada? Maybe it was his spiritual master, I don't remember. He was sitting at his desk writing, and suddenly this hand just came floating in the air through the open window. And he just turned and saw it there in the sky, and he just said, Hare Krishna, <laughs> gone. <laughs> so this, this is a devotee. <laughs> we have nothing to fear from anyone. All right, so it is said that whenever the, wherever the chanting of the Holy Name of Krishna is done, even negligently, all bad elements, witches, ghosts, and dangerous calamities, immediately disappear. Ordinarily, at this time of day, we don't mention these things, right? Because it's Sanjya, that's when they were, they're going around, right? But this is Krishna Katha. So, and this is certainly true of the place where the chanting of the Holy Name of Krishna is done very seriously, especially in Vrindavan, when the Supreme Lord was personally present. Not possible for these dark creatures to exercise any influence in Krishna Lila, unless it's part of the Lila, which was the case. Okay. So Putana was coming and she was doing this. <clears throat> and uh, so here Prabhupada is pointing out that this is, they, we have nothing to fear of these entities. If we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore the doubts of Nanda Maharaj were certainly based on affection for Krishna. Actually there was no danger from the activities of Putana, despite her powers. Such witches are called Kechari, Kechari. Not Kichari, Kichari. <laughs> K in the sky, Chari, there you go, right? Kitobadeshta is a verse that reminds me. Dasha Shatakara Dhari. Dasha Shatakara Dhari. That means he's, he's holding, he's got Dasha Shata, a thousand hands. Who is that? Has a thousand hands. Huh? No, good guess though. Dasha Shatakaradhari, Kalmasha Tongsakari. And he dispels all the darkness. Krishna. The sun. What are the hands of the sun? The 10,000 10, hands of the sun, what are they? Yes, the Kirana. Those are like his hands, right? And even the moon sometimes has to be eclipsed. Both of them. The sun has to be eclipsed sometimes, sometimes the moon has to be eclipsed. So what is the conclusion? What is that? Uh, whatever is written on your forehead, you cannot overcome that. <laughs> even if you're the sun, even if you're the moon. All right, I'm getting off track here, but Kechari, they go in the sky. Just like we have another one is not Kechari, but Nishacha, right? What is a nishachara? When do they roam around? Night. Night. Yeah, you hear them sometimes, right? Here in Houston, right? Mega bass speakers. <laughs> you hear it, right? Those 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 creatures are called nishacharas because they're you know three in the morning. They're out looking for God knows what. You don't want to come in contact with them. You want to hear a true story? This happened here in Houston, Texas, right on 34th. Is it 34th Street, right? So this is about 30 years ago. 
there was a devotee newlywed from Mauritius, and uh, he's passed away. His widow is still in Mauritius. She went back, but they were living here in Texas. So around four in the morning, his newly young girl, she was not even initiated yet, she was walking to Mongolarchi on West 34th Street. And then some car pulled up next to her and they opened the door. So she just thought, okay, there's some devotees are coming to Mongolarchi. And so she thought, I'll, I'll get a ride. So she was just about to step into the car when she noticed it was not a devotee at the wheel of the car. Who was it? Nishacharas. Yeah. Some, some monster was there doing God only knows what. So then she quickly was saved. Anyway, it can happen. But uh, Kecharis, they can, they can fly in the sky. Prabhupada says, this black art of witchcraft is still practiced by some women in the remote northwestern side of India. They can transfer themselves from one place to another on the branch of an uprooted tree. Western mythology, we have a, they fly on brooms. <laughs> kind of similar, right? So Putana knew this craft, and therefore she is described in the Bhagavatam as Kecheri. Putana entered the country, county of Gokula, the residential quarter of Nanda Maharaj, without permission, dressing herself just like a beautiful woman. She entered the house of Mother Yashoda. She appeared very beautiful, with raised hips, nice uh, full breasts, earrings, and flowers in her hair. She looked especially beautiful on account of her thin waist. And she was glancing at everyone with very attractive looks and smiling faces, and all the residents of Vrindavan, because they're, after all, simple cowherds, what did they think? They were captivated. The innocent cowherd women thought that she was a goddess of fortune, appearing in Vrindavan with a lotus flower in her hand. That's called Krida Padma. It, it just, you know, it, it serves no purpose other than entertainment. <laughs> so this is Lakshmi. She holds a flower, such a flower in each hand, as a matter of fact. So it seemed to them that she had personally come to see Krishna, who is, after all, her husband. Because of her exquisite beauty, no one checked her movement, and therefore she freely entered the house of Nanda Maharaj, Putana, the killer of many, many children, found baby Krishna lying on a small bed, and she could at once perceive that the baby was hiding his unparalleled potencies. Putana thought, this child is so powerful that he can destroy the whole universe immediately. She was no fool, Putana. Maybe a demon, but sometimes the demons are very intelligent. Just like Elon Musk, right? <laughs> or Vladimir Putin. They're very intelligent. We need to say no more. So, <clears throat> Putin's understanding is very significant. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna is situated in everyone's heart. It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita that he gives one necessary intelligence. And he also causes one to forget. Putana was immediately aware that the child whom she was observing in the house of Nanda Maharaj was the Supreme Personality of God him, himself. He was lying there as a small baby, but that does not mean that he was less powerful. The materialistic theory that God worship is anthropomorphic is not correct. What does anthropomorphic mean? It means we imagine that God is like us. But actually, it's the other, the other way around. <laughs> God, God considers that we're like him. <laughs> so. No living being can become God by undergoing meditation or austerities. God is always God. Krishna, as the child baby, is as complete as he is as a full-fledged youth. The Mayavadi theory holds that the living entity was formerly God, but has now become overwhelmed by the influence of Maya. Therefore, they say that presently he's not God, but when the influence of Maya is taken away, then he again becomes God. This theory cannot be applied to the minute living entities. In other words, it's bogus. The living entities are minute parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, their minute particles are sparks of the supreme fire, so to speak, but they're not the original fire or Krishna. 
Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even from the beginning of his appearance in the house of Vasudeva and Devaki. So Ramanujacharya has given this uh, example. You have a big fire, and then you have sparks emanating from that fire. Those sparks are like us, little tiny, tiny jivas. We're also fire. You can say, aham brahmasmi, or tatvamasi, I'm the same. But you can't say that you're absolutely the same because you're tiny, tiny, tiny. What's another analogy given? Like a drop of water out of the Gulf of Mexico, right? You have the Gulf of Mexico, you've all seen it. Not very far from here. A drop of water is also water. Seawater is also water. One drop of seawater has all the constituent elements, salt and minerals and you know, plankton and what else but it's not the whole ocean. So similarly, we have everything that God has, including feelings, including desires, including will, but we're very, very small in our potency because we're tiny in size. So this is the point here. Krishna, although he's tiny, it doesn't mean he's less potent. He has all the potency, and Pujana was intelligent enough to see this. She was no fool. Krishna showed the nature of a small baby and closed his eyes as if to avoid the face of Putana. This closing of his eyes is interpreted and studied in different ways by devotees. Some say that Krishna closed his eyes because he didn't like to see the face of Putana, who had killed so many children and who had now come to kill him. Others say that something extraordinary was being dictated to her, and in order to give her assurance, Krishna closed his eyes so that she would not be frightened. <laughs> and yet others interpret it this way. Krishna appeared to kill the demons and give protection to the devotees, as it is stated in Bhagavad Gita. The first demon to be killed was a woman. According to Vedic rules, killing of women, brahmanas, cows, or children is forbidden. So Krishna was obliged to kill the demon Putana, but because the killing of a woman is forbidden, according to Vedic Shastra, he could not help but close his eyes. Another interpretation is that Krishna closed his eyes because he simply took Pujana to be his nurse. Pujana came to Krishna just to offer her breast for the Lord to suck. But Krishna is so merciful that even though he knew Pujana was there to kill him, still he took her as his nurse or as his mother. There are seven kinds of mothers. Well, who are they? Seven kinds of mothers. Your biological mother? Who else? Guru Patni? Who else? Huh? Mother Earth. Huh? Baby. Huh? Mother Earth and? Cow. Cow? Brother and the No. Nurse. Nurse maid, yes. And? Two more. Rajapatni, the queen. And who else? Brahman's wife, yes. So these, these are seven mothers. So you can't kill them. So Krishna treated her as his mother, and she was given the same facility as Yashoda. As Yashoda was given liberation from the material world, and, and Putana was also given liberation. When the baby Krishna closed his eyes, Putana took him on her lap. She did not know that she was holding death personified. He fooled her. And Krishna will fool all of us if we try to cheat him also. What does he say in Bhagavad Gita? Mrityu sarvaharashchaham. As death, I take it all away, everything. Think about all the things that you're attached to, all the things that you, I mean, it's all going to be taken away. It's just a question of time. We don't know when, but it's definite, you will lose everything. Think about that. Make a strategic plan <laughs> for this fact, because it's unavoidable. All right, so this is how Krishna was dealing with her. He gave her great mercy. Pujana, anyway, here it says, if a person mistakes a snake to be a rope, he dies. Similarly, Pujana killed so many babies before meeting Krishna, but now she was accepting the snake that would ultimately, that would kill her immediately. You got this comparison? She had killed so many children. So many times it was just not a snake, it's just a rope, right? 
But this time, he looks just like another child. But this is not a rope. <laughs> this is a snake. In other words, it's an indirect way of saying Krishna has the potency to kill her, and that's what he did. <coughs> exactly. So while Pujana was taking baby Krishna on her lap, both Yashoda and Rohini were present, but they didn't forbid her because she was so beautifully dressed and because she showed motherly affection towards Krishna. In a civilized society, any baby, any, any mata can hold that baby and give the baby bodhi, right? Anyone. It, among friends and civilized people, everybody appreciates. Now, in current society, society is so full of demons, what happens? You can't leave your baby unattended for even one second. It's the smoke. You might want to open a window. You can open the door. Or just unplug the smoke alarm. <laughs> and what devotees do. So they all said nothing. They thought, oh, she's so beautiful. She may, maybe she's even a demigoddess, or maybe she's, you know, some great personality, and she's showing affection to Krishna. So they were simple cowherds. They got taken, and but Krishna wasn't taken. Krishna knew exactly. So Krishna, what did he do? They could not understand that she is a sword within a decorated case. Or as we say, an iron fist within a velvet glove. <laughs> That's what Putana was. Dressed as if she was Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, externally showing very maternal affection, matra bhava, towards Krishna. But Krishna could understand everything. So what did he do? He immediately after uh, Putana had smeared a very powerful poison on her breast, and immediately after taking the baby on her lap, she pushed her breast nipple in within his mouth. She was hoping that as soon as he would suck her breast, he would die. But baby Krishna very quickly took the nipple in anger. Here's where Krishna showed his real colors also. He sucked of milk poison along with the life air of the demon. In other words, Krishna simultaneously sucked the milk from her breast and killed her by sucking out her very life itself. Krishna was so merciful, so merciful that because the demon Pujana came to offer her breast milk to him, he fulfilled her desire and accepted her activity as motherly. But to stop her from further nefarious activities, he immediately killed her. So, we don't kill women, and Krishna doesn't like to kill women. But what to do? She's going to go and kill so many more Children. And what kind of children is she going to kill? Babies. babies, yes. But what kind of babies? Innocent. Innocent, yes. All babies are innocent, more or less. But what kind of innocent babies? Spiritual. Spiritual babies. Brijavasis. And Svagosham Nimajantam Akhyapayantam. He wants to show these are my people. You cannot mistreat them. So he sucked out her very life to stop her from further sinful activities, for our own benefit also. So Krishna is so merciful that because the demon Pujana came to offer her breast milk to him, she, he fulfilled her desire and accepted her activity as motherly, but to stop her from further nefarious activities, he immediately killed her. And because the demon was killed by Krishna, she got liberation. When Krishna sucked out her very breath, Pujana fell down on the ground, spread her arms and legs, and began to cry, Oh child, leave me, leave me. She was cry crying loudly and perspiring, and her whole body became wet. As she died, screaming, there was tremendous vibration both on earth and in the sky, in all directions, and people thought that thunderbolts were falling. Did you hear it this morning? Thunder? That's what they heard in Vrindavan when this happened. <laughs> she opened a very fierce mouth and spread her arms and legs all over. She fell exactly as Ritrasura when struck by the thunderbolt of Indra. The long hair on her head was scattered all over her body. Her fallen body extended up to 12 miles and smashed all the trees to pieces. Everyone was struck with wonder upon seeing this gigantic body. Her teeth appeared just like plowed roads, 
and her nostrils appeared like mountain caves. Her breasts appeared like small hills, and her hair was a vast reddish bush. Her eye sockets appeared like blind wells, and her two thighs appeared like two banks of a river, and her hands appeared like two strongly constructed bridges, and her abdomen seemed like a dried up lake. All the cowherd men and women became struck with awe and wonder upon seeing this, and the tumultuous sound of her falling shocked their brains and ears and made their hearts beat strongly. Can you imagine this? What a scene. When the gopis saw little Krishna fearlessly playing on Bhutana's lap, they very quickly came and picked him up. Mother Yashoda, Rohini, and the other elderly gopis immediately performed the auspicious rituals by taking the tail of a cow and circumambulating his body. The child was completely washed with the urine of a cow and the dust create, created by the hooves of the cows was thrown all over his body. This was all just to save little Krishna from future inauspicious accidents. This incident gives us a clear indication of how important the cow is to the family, society, and to living beings in general. The transcendental body of Krishna did not require any protection, but to instruct us on the importance of the cow, the Lord was smeared over with cow dung, washed with the urine of a cow, and sprinkled with the dust upraised by the hosts of the cows. After this purificatory process, the gopis headed by Madhya Shoda and Rohini chanted 12 names of Vishnu to give Krishna's body full protection from all evil influences. They washed their hands and feet and sipped water three times, as is the custom before chanting mantras. They chanted as follows, My dear Krishna, may the Lord who is known as Maniman protect your thighs. May Lord Vishnu who is known as Yajna protect your legs. May Lord Achuta protect your arms. May Lord Hayagriva protect your abdomen. May Lord Keshava protect your heart. May Lord Vishnu protect your arms. And may Lord Urukrama protect your face. May Lord Ishwara protect your head. May Lord Chakradhara protect your front. May Lord Galadhara protect your back. And may Lord Matusudana, who carries a bow in his hand, protect your eyesight. May Lord Vishnu with his conch shell protect your left side. May the personality of God and Upendra protect you from above. And may Lord Tarkshya protect you from below. May Lord Haladhara protect you from all sides. And may the personality of God known as Vishikesh protect all of your senses. May Lord Narayana protect your breath. May the Lord of Shwetapit Narayana protect your heart. May Lord Yogeshwara protect your mind. May Lord Prashnigarha protect your intelligence. And may the Supreme Personality of Godhead protect your soul. While you are playing, may Lord Govinda protect you from all sides. When you are sleeping, may Lord Madhava protect you from all danger. When you are working, may the Lord of Vaikuntha protect you from falling down. When you are sitting, may the Lord of Vaikuntha give you all protection. And when you are eating, may the Lord of Sacrifices give you all protection. Thus, Mother Yashoda began to chant different names of Vishnu to protect the child Krishna's different bodily parts. <clears throat> what is this called? Kavachastotra. Yes, Kavacham. Just like you can chant. Uh, Om Madhavo Madhavo Vachi, Madhavo Madhavo Hridi, Svananti Sadhvaha Sarve, Sarvakarishu Madhavam. The name Madhava, it applies to everything. Whatever we're doing, whatever in our words, in our thoughts, in our actions, if we remember the name of Madhava, then everything is auspicious. But there are others as well, Kalachas. Shirome Bala Krishna Shapata Nitya Mama Shruti. Narayana Hapatu, Kantham, Gopi Vanjat, Kopolakam, Nasike, Patu Nariharihi, in this way, so many different things. Janardana Hapatu, Dantan, Adharam Madhavas Tata, Ityadi. They were doing like this. The elderly gopis of Vrindavan were so absorbed in affection for Krishna that they wanted to save him, although there was no such need, for he had already protected himself. They could not understand that Krishna was the Supreme Personality of God and playing as a child. After performing the formalities to protect the child, Madhya Yashoda took Krishna and let him suck her breast. 
When the child was protected by Vishnu Mantra, Mother Yashoda felt that he was safe. In the meantime, all the cowherd men who went to Mathura to pay tax returned home and were struck with wonder at seeing the gigantic dead body of Putana. How big was that body? 15 miles. Huh? 12 miles. said 12 miles here, yeah. So she assumed her real form. Just like we have a form that we present ourselves to the society, right? But in our hearts, there's another form, isn't there? Externally, we present that everything's very nice, we're very friendly, but actually we're looking at everything in terms of what can I get out of this, who's a threat to me, what do I have to do with this to get where I want to be, etc., etc. See? So Putina had this form also, and she revealed that actual form. It was a lot worse than ours. <laughs> but we all have it to some degree. So. Nanda Maharaj recalled the prophecy of Vasudeva and considered him to be a great sage or mystic yogi. Otherwise, how could he have foretold an incident that happened during his absence from Vrindavan? So, this is Putanavata. And as we said, Krishna is worshipable, worshipable by great demigods like Brahma and Lord Shiva. And Putana was so fortunate that the same Krishna played in her lap as a little child. The lotus feet of Krishna which are worshipped by the great sages and devotees, were placed on the body of Putana. People worship Krishna and offer food, but automatically he sucks the milk from the body of Putana. Devotees therefore pray that if simply by offering something as an enemy, Putana got so much benefit, then who can measure the benefit of worshipping Krishna in love and affection? That's how we began. So, one should only worship Krishna if, for no other reason, then so much benefit awaits the worshiper. Although Putana was an evil spirit, she gained elevation just like the mother of the Supreme Lord. It is clear that the cows and the elderly gopis who offered milk to Krishna were also elevated to the transcendental position. Krishna can offer anyone, anything, from liberation to anything materially conceivable. Therefore, there cannot be any doubt about the salvation of Putana, whose bodily milk was sucked by Krishna for such a long time. And how can there be any doubt about the salvation of the gopis, who were so fond of Krishna? Undoubtedly, all the gopis and cowherd boys and cows who served Krishna in Vrindavan with love and affection were liberated from the miserable condition of material existence. So then they had to get rid of this 12-mile-long dead body of Putana. What did they do? They chopped it up and they burnt it. And what happened when they burnt it? It smelled like sandalwood <laughs> because she was killed by Krishna. So this is the story of Putana in this way. Ananda Maharaj uh, came home and immediately took the, up his child on his lap and began to smell his head. In this way, he was quite satisfied that his little child was saved from a great calamity. Srila Shukadeva Goswami has blessed that all persons who hear the narration of killing Putana by Krishna will surely attain the favor of Govinda. That means all of you are going to be blessed by Govinda just for hearing this story tonight. So remember, remember, if Putana could come to kill Krishna and was liberated, beyond liberation, she gained a place in Goloka, then what will happen to us if we approach Krishna with a good motive, not to kill him, but to kill our artists. Okay, anybody have any questions or any comments about this famous pastime? So if I heard you correctly when you were reading, uh, it's, it is stated that Krishna liberated not just the way he liberated Yeshua. But That's Yishu, what it says, yeah. Right. But Yishudama is Nitya Siddha, right? That's right. Namam Sri It says elsewhere in the 10th canto. Not even Brahma, not even Shiva, nor even the Lord's own wife, Lakshmi, got as much mercy from Krishna as Yashoda did. And yet this Pujana who came to kill him, she was given almost an equal position of Yashoda. Not exactly equal. We can never be equal. But she was made into a dhatri. And dhatri is one of the mothers. In the sense that they're both mothers, she got equal position. 
Ms. Krishna? So how is that possible? I think your question is a little different. Your question is that why does Yashoda need liberation if she's a Nitya Siddha? Well, that's true. She doesn't. But you know, for the for the just to just to drive home the point that Madhi Yashoda and all of Krishna's associates are already liberated, we say like that. That Krishna gave them liberation. We say he's given it to them eternal liberation. But for us, if we follow these great personalities, then we also get liberated. Actually, we're already liberated, <laughs> in some sense. And we're not only liberated, but we have our eternal constitutional position, just like Pujana did. The problem is what? We've double-clicked on it. And so, you know, the program is still running, but it's been minimized. <laughs> That's our problem. And by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, then we, we bring it back on the desktop and we begin to regard that, you know, this is going on and I need to do something about it. In other words, that's the process of Krishna consciousness. Okay? So, Prabhuji, the Acharyas uh, give the allegory of the various demons. Uh, maybe you alluded to that. So, what do the Acharyas uh, uh, refer to uh, Putana as? I don't understand your question. Yeah, different demons, you know, represent different. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Personalities. Yeah, offhand, I don't recall. Bhakti Thakur talks about this. I think it's in his. Uh, Krishna Samhita is it? Possibly. Yeah, he talks uh, how different demons that are killed by Krishna represent different anartas that need to be destroyed by us. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't remember offhand. Who does Pujana represent? I, just offhand, I can't remember. Oh, I do remember. Pujana re re represents the tendency to become a bogus teacher. Isn't that uh, something to think about? Yeah, somebody who's... Well, Prabhupada said, what do you call it when somebody who takes the position of a teacher, but he doesn't really know what he's talking about? There was, there's a famous uh, conversation. Srila Prabhupada had invited a bunch of academic scholars, religious religion scholars, very, you know, respected men, accomplished men in society. They were all sitting together in Prabhupada's garden, and Prabhupada didn't spare them any expense. Prabhupada just very pointedly said, what is, what is God? Who can tell me? And all these religion scholars, they all say, well, that's like, you know, that's too much for us. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, oh, why, why, why is that? You see, the, the theologians are arguing about this since time immemorial, and Prabhupada said, oh, Krishna is talking here in Bhagavad Gita, he says, I'm God. But you're a religious man, why aren't you teaching? Why, don't, why you don't know what God is? And then he turned to Surabdhamadar, his disciple, scientist. No, Surabdhamadar, I think it was, in L.A. at least. It may have happened elsewhere as well, but this time. What, is, what do you call that, Surabdhamadar, when a person is teaching something, but he doesn't know what he's teaching? And so Dhammadar could understand it was his cue. What did he say? Cheater, Cheater Prabhupada. Cheater. <laughs> Prabhupada said, yes. Prabhupada was so strong with these men. You know, from a from all mundane point of view, it would not be the right thing to say. But Prabhupada was very transcendental. And he saw that I have to elevate these men. They're godly men. But, you know, they're not doing their duty. And it's my duty to tell them that they're not doing their duty. You let them have it. Without any, without any hesitation, you let them have it. So that's what it means. Pujana represents the so-called bogus gurus and so-called teachers who are actually misleading us. Misleading instead of really teaching what, what they need to. In other words, Pitana sasya, jananina sasya, gurana sasya, ityadi. You should not become an authority, you should not take the position of any authority if you cannot actually deliver your dependents or your subordinates from birth and death. That's your responsibility. So Prabhupada was reminding them of that. 
into the point. Bhagavatam says, it's a very weighty responsibility to become any kind of teacher, any kind of guru. And so this is what Pujana represents, bogus gurus. Another, th another characteristic of the bogus guru that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur points out is that as soon as these cheaters and rascals see any little budding faith in a faithful person, they try to kill it. <laughs> they don't want that to happen. They just they do any, just just as Pujana tried to kill Krishna, even when he was just an infant, before he could even grow up, she wanted him dead. So these demons and rascals, before anyone's faith can really, let's all turn off our cell phones. This is like the third time in as many minutes. <clears throat> So who does, who does Putin I represent? Yeah, they, they don't want anyone's faith to even bud at all, what to speak of flower or, or bear fruit. They don't want to see that. So they try to mislead you as soon as they can. Your teachers, sometimes your parents even, sometimes the you know, so-called spiritual masters. It's so sad nowadays. People try to look for spiritual life on the internet and what do they get? You know who they get. My body businessmen from Coin Vitor and other rascals who cannot actually help anybody. So anyway, this is this is what Krishna represents, according to our charges. Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his son. <clears throat> Anything else? but it's very difficult say the person is not in a, in a family like they are not spiritual but if you go out there will be a lot of it's very confused like uh, who is the real <coughs> real teacher say for example for me like uh, what, what are books like I say okay this book so I go read the book I don't know really it's a uh, uh, mm. Guru or Hard to tell. Raise your hand if you've ever bought gold. Anybody here ever bought gold? Yes. Yeah. What do you do when you go to buy gold? What do you need to know? But what do you need to know? I mean, before you go anywhere, what do you have to know? What's the price of gold? Who's a reputable dealer? Usually who tells us this? Mother. <laughs> right? <laughs> Or some, you know, some trusted person. You have to do that much at least. You have to know what is gold before you stuff your 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 pockets with cash and head for Chor Bazaar, right? You you don't want to get cheated. You have to know what you're looking for. So in the same way, with a spiritual teacher, you have to know what there's a science here. He has certain qualifications. He should meet those qualifications. If you go to a doctor. Why is it that they put their credentials in a, in a frame on the wall? Because they want you to know that I'm not a quack. It's the same thing. When you get in an airline, it's understood that that pilot has been trained and he's been authorized and he's been cleared. Yes, he can fly a plane. What if he has, you know, some bipolar disorder or, you know, whatever it is. He, the, the person may have a psychiatric, a clinically, you know, crazy person. Are they going to let him fly a plane? Probably not. So, why is it any different with spiritual life? In spiritual life, if you want to learn something bona fide, you have to see that the person is actually a qualified teacher, and you have to know what those qualifications are in order to do that. Fortunately for us, Srila Prabhupada spelled these things out very clearly all throughout his books. And if it were not for his books, it's pretty likely that all of us would be misled and confused. It is very likely. Because people don't cultivate this sensible knowledge anymore. What to speak of spiritual life, even for our, our material life, sometimes we don't pay so much attention to the most important aspects. Like relationships, right? We go through so much care and attention before we decide where to invest our money. If you want to purchase a house, you really do your homework, isn't it? If you want to go to college, you have to check it out, which one is offering what. 
you know, you have to do all this calculation, but when it comes to maintaining a relationship, we just wing it, right? Isn't it true? Nobody trains you how to do this stuff. But with a spiritual master, then how much more important is it? Because you can mess up your life if you make a wrong material decision, but if you make the wrong spiritual decision, you can mess up yourself for many lifetimes. So we have to know. It's sobering, isn't it? You have to, to be a bona fide human being means you have to understand these things. Who is qualified to teach? Who should I learn from? Who should I not be careful to avoid? What are my responsibilities? What are the teacher's responsibilities? What is the science itself? And how, how do you understand these things? It's there in Shastra. Shastra Yonidvat. Shatra Yonidvat means books are the basis. So thank God for Srila Prabhupada because without his, I haven't seen that anywhere his spiritual life is so clearly explained as it is in Srila Prabhupada's books. I've not seen it. I mentioned this the other night. I read several editions of Bhagavad Gita before I came to Iskand, but I didn't understand them because the publishers also didn't understand them because they were not coming in Parampara. But after I read Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, I could understand everything very clearly because it's Paramparagat. It's like somebody turned on the lights and everything was very clear, every question answered, comprehensive, practical, common sense, simple language, very, very clear. If you, if you, if you find somebody who's transparent enough to simply repeat what Krishna has said, and it's there in black and white. You can look it up in Bhagavad Gita. Every verse is there. Find somebody who's simply repeating what Krishna says and take lessons from that person. Otherwise, if somebody's saying all this, you know, gobbledygook and, you know, hocus pocus stuff that is very vague and you don't know where it's leading and you don't know anything more after six months than when you started, be careful because that's, that's the sign of a cheater. So Putina represents these rascals, and there's so many of them. It's such a shame. I, I don't know, I've lost count of the number of people who said they're, they're looking for genuine spiritual life on the internet, and the only thing that comes up is, you know, one or another cheater who says he's God, or he says we're all God, or there is no God, or something. So, is that helping to answer your question? I mean, it, it, it's a fate, it's a fate of the person. Say, uh, for example, one person he is very honest, he is very, uh, but he end up with uh, some, some. No, that's not possible. Because Krishna says, Yeya tamam prapadyante tansa taila vidami. I will commensurately, I will reciprocate with that person according to his sincerity. Te sham satati yuktanam bharatam priti purakam dadami vurti yogam tam. Krishna says, if the person is sincere and worshipping me with faith, I will give him the intelligence by which he can come to me. But he will give you bewilderment also, if that's what you want. Not exactly fate of the person, it's the desire of the person also. If we're sincere, and if we pray sincerely, then Krishna will certainly not I mean, he's not going to ignore us. Cheated or cheated? People are, there, there are two kinds of people in this world. One is the cheater. These are the Pujanas. And the others are the cheated. And they're also Pujanas. <laughs> because only a cheater can be cheated. That's hard pill to swallow. But it's true. If we're sincere, we will not be misled. Because sincere means you find out what is the price of gold, you find out where's a reputable dealer. You find out everything what you're looking for, what's the weight, what's the price, everything. You have to know these things. And these, this information is there in Bhagavad Gita. It's there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We just have to open the books and read them. But people don't do that. Therefore, they get cheated. And whose fault is it? I want to go. I want to drive to Chicago, but I'm not going to consult a map, nor GPS, nor am I going to inquire from anyone. I just want to do it on my own. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. Right? The same thing. <coughs> this sounds a little harsh, right? But that's the way it is. Life is like that. 
And so, so many people are ready to take advantage of us, but you, if you're reading Srila Prabhupada's books very carefully every day, nobody can pull the wool over your eyes. Because Prabhupada is, he stayed up every night just to write these books for those of us 50 years after his death, that we, you know, there will be some sincere people. And Krishna arranged that Prabhupada is my agent to reciprocate with those sincere people, and they will get the guidance that they require, and they will be saved from so much pain. This is how Krishna takes care of us. Is it okay? What else? Prabhupada, yeah, I had a question. Uh, so it is said in Brahma Samhita, Angani Yasya Sakalendri. So Krishna senses, you know, act in any which way. Uh, so we've, uh, you know, seen in Bhagavad Puran that Krishna blesses, you know, Dhruva or uh, other devotees, you know, but he blesses them with a concern and then, you know, then they store offerings of prayers like that. So basically there's a transformation that happens when one comes in contact with Krishna's senses. Yeah, definitely. So why do the demons, when they come in contact with Krishna's senses, they don't, you know, they don't have a transformation, but they go through with their evil, nefarious deeds? Yeah, well that's what defines a demon. <laughs> He's just stubborn. He's not going to give up. And, you know, the only, what can Krishna do? Krishna's, you know, his principle, he states in Bhagavad Gita very clearly, I'm ready to reciprocate with anyone as they worship me, I will reciprocate commensurately. But if a person is not willing to do that, what, is, what else can Krishna do? It's like the question that was raised here. She's a woman, but why did Krishna kill her anyway? Well, what can he do? She's going around killing all these little children who are also girls, right? just like they do in India nowadays, or just like they do here for that matter. Also, no. So what, what, what's he supposed to do? He has to kill her. That's what it means to be a demon. They just don't listen. And Krishna says, these are the ones that, you know, they just, they get sucked deeper and deeper into the vortex of Maya, and they take themselves to hell, practically speaking. It's said, you give somebody a rope that's long enough, he'll eventually hang himself with it. So, you know, this is what the demons do. What is that? Dwao Bhuta Sargao Lokesman Daiva Asura Evacha Vishnu Bhakta Svrto Daiva Asura Stad Viparya So they're Viparya they're In this world there are two kinds of living entities the Devas and the Asuras The Devas are the ones who are accepting the Lord and his, and his uh, Shastras and his Acharyas etc. And the Asuras are the ones who are constantly opposed What can you do? If somebody the cooperation, we always talk about cooperation. But if somebody's principle is non-cooperation, what can you do? There, now in the world, there are so many wars going on, isn't it? Why are those wars going on? Because people don't want to cooperate, actually. Their principle is non-cooperation. Well, what can you do? <laughs> there has to be a fight. Now, Krishna has a tough position because... You know, the, the Arab is praying that give me the intelligence to kill the Israeli, and the Israeli is praying, please give me the intelligence to kill the Arab. What's Krishna supposed to do? <laughs> so, you know. Anyway, the demon means if a person is abiding by the words of God and is trying to devote himself to God's will, that person is a devotee. And if a person is always against that, no matter what, then what can he do? That's what the person is a demon. There's only so much you can do with somebody who doesn't want to reform. Yeah. I mean, we have our free will. This is why people say, why do we fall into Maya and you know, become illusioned? If God is you know, all knowledge and capable of enlightening us, then why doesn't he do so? Who knows the answer to that question? You, you get what I'm asking? There's so much suffering in the world, we're suffering on account of our ignorance, so why doesn't Krishna just, you know, clear us all up so that we can see everything as it is? What's the answer? Sometimes from suffering we, we will learn. Okay, that, but that's not the majority of the time. They want to be ignorant. Born to be, yeah, we're also born ignorant, okay, but that's, that can be rectified. We want to be ignorant. Yeah, we want to be ignorant. This is the problem. <laughs> 
You know, it's like when your alarm clock goes off in the morning, it's so much more comfortable just hit the snooze button, right? <laughs> you know, especially if you set your alarm for, say, two or three in the morning. <laughs> Who wants to do that? So what, what can be done? It's not AI, right? It's not robotics. Krishna just programs a person to always be enlightened, to, to always be uh, devoted to me, and you know, that's, that's not love. That's robotics. Krishna wants love. And we also want free choice, isn't it? We don't want to be pre-programmed and we have no independence. We also want our independence. That, that is our small qualification that we share with God. God is independent. We are also a little bit independent. So th that makes love possible. Without, that without the choice to either surrender or to not surrender, then you can't call it love. It's just, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, computer programming. But love means you have your sentient being, you have your own will, you have your own choice, and Krishna respects that. But if somebody misuses that free will, then well, what can Krishna do about it? He's not going to take it away from you. He just keeps trying. Life after life after life after life. Look at it this way, Jarasandha, right? He also had this <laughs> determination. Seventeen times he came to fight with Krishna, seventeen times. His entire army was slaughtered. Only he alone went back home, and how did he get there? He walked because even his animals were killed. Still he keeps coming back. That's the kind of determination that is possible in this world. But it works the other way around also. It no matter how many times we fall, if we just keep getting up and going back to Krishna and say, I'm just a rascal and I am a fool, but I am your devotee, please take care of me. How can he not listen to that? Any fool, any rascal who offends you so grievously, if he comes and sincerely surrenders, what are you going to feel? And unless, unless you're not sentient, unless you're a total narcissist or a sociopath, you, you have to feel that, you know, you, you have to forgive that person. Hey, Krishna's like that. So free will is, a, is the crux of the matter. Without free will, love is impossible. And, Nobody, nobody cares for anything in this world if not love. Love is the thing that everyone wants most. And Krishna is no different. Is that okay? Thank you. Anything else? Nahito okay. Okay, you all have to work in the morning. I also have to work in the morning. So we can stop here. And there's prasadam, right? Yes. So yeah, you'll thank me for ending early. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. When your alarm goes off and you don't want to. <laughs> okay, so thank you all very much. Au revoir, Chita Prabhupada.